Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Good morning, family. Let's just take a moment to pray for the families of those who have been affected uh, by those who have given their life uh, for our country. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we thank you for the sacrifice of the life of those uh, who have served this country so that we might be free. We pray that you bring comfort to the families of those um, who may be affected and continue to be peace in their life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Well, family, welcome to the second week of our conversation about reconstructing our faith. This uh, series is intended to bring awareness to people who have deconstructed their faith in the process of reconstructing one's faith. Uh, Our big idea is that this big word, deconstruction, is not a place to stay, but a place to build from, okay? Uh, Our scripture for the series is Jeremiah uh, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. God is telling Jeremiah that he has given them, given him the power and the authority to deconstruct and to construct. Today I have a couple of my friends here, and we are going to talk about this process of deconstruction and reconstruction. Um, But before we jump into uh, that part, let's pray real quick and ask the Lord uh, to guide us through our conversation today. Father, we come to you today and we ask that you would speak to us through your word and from our experiences. May what is spoken today bring life and truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, family, I grew up in the South. Do we have any other Southerners in the room today? Let me see. Okay, I I see a couple of you. South New York. (laughs) Southern New York. (laughs) So um, growing up in the South, everyone uh, was a Christian. Everyone was saved. Everyone had a relationship with God, uh, no matter their lifestyle, right? And so I understand that that um, dynamic is different here in the Northeast. Uh, There are a lot of different uh, religions and backgrounds and things of that nature. But that wasn't my... um, Reality. My reality was everybody was saved down in the Bible Belt. Well, uh, my aunt told me the story about my uncle going through the process of uh, deconstruction. Wait, say uncle again. Oh, no. (laughs) Uncle. 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 (laughs) Southern, man. (laughs) And so um, she told me about the process that he was going through uh, deconstruction. He had a lot of questions about his faith and about uh, who God was in his life and uh, why he was going through certain situations and he just couldn't get the answers. It was not resolved within him. And so he went to school one day and there was a group of Muslims that came to the school and for whatever reason, they answered all of his questions. He had everything answered and he converted in that moment. And so he went home and he said, family, I have an announcement to tell you. I am now a Muslim. Well, uh, my grandmother is, uh, well, she was 5'4", very feisty, a believer, um, and she wasn't playing that. And so she, she grabbed a wooden broom and started beating my uncle across the head and saying, how dare you come in my house as good as God done been to us <laughs> and say that you're a Muslim. Um, and the story goes is uh, that she beat the Muslim right after out of him because um, <laughs> now, <laughs> now he's a believer. <laughs> and he's now white. <laughs> No, I'm not going going to say that that's the correct way to convert somebody. (laughs) But, you know, at least that's my public statement because we're being recorded, but you could talk to me after service. (laughs) Uh, No, but seriously, um, I have gone through the process of deconstructing my faith and reconstructing my faith multiple times. Um, And what I found out is this. When we deconstruct our faith without the Holy Spirit as our guide, we inevitably end up empty and broken, searching and longing for fulfillment from temporary resources. Yeah, it's good. You see, it is a dangerous demonic scheme to deconstruct our faith without the Holy Spirit 
as our guide. Yes. Yeah. We have a resource. We have the blueprint. Yeah. We have something to look towards. So that's what we're going to talk about today um, and talk about some different elements of people who have been church hurt or are in the process of deconstructing their faith. Uh, I want to start with Pastor John Mark. Uh, Pastor John Mark, have you dealt with the s specific topic of toxic leadership when it comes to uh, deconstructing one's faith? Yes. Yes, actually I have. I've been serving here at Family Church for 17 years, coming up about 17 years. So I've had many, many, many jobs, and I've been through many different things, and I can remember it was a Christmas um, Eve service, and I was playing percussion. I, I played percussion. I played bongos, bongos, all that kind of crazy stuff. And I was playing percussion, and I was playing a little too joyfully, a little too loud. <laughs> and one of the musicians turned to me, which I looked up to, and looked at me and says, hey, you know, percussion is not the most important thing here in the band. Which, I get what he's saying. I know, it's a triangle and the ding -ling -ling, you know, <laughs> not a big deal. But for me, what I heard was, you're not important to the yeah. team. Yeah. And so that hurt me very, very deeply. And I kind of said, man, maybe I'm not. Maybe. And I started to think and started to feel a certain way. and said, you know, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe church isn't for me. Maybe, you know, I shouldn't continue. But I, and then I heard in myself to like, well, who do you serve? Who do you serve? Who, who, are, you, who are you following? What I'm not saying is to stay in toxic leadership. What I'm not saying is to stay with people who are physically abusing you, who are mentally and spiritually abusing you. But what I am saying is for me, I had to go and turn to the scriptures. I had to remember what God said about me. I had to remember that God told me that I was the head and not the tail above only and never beneath. Yeah. That greater is he that lives in me than he that liveth in the world. So I had to encourage myself yeah. in the Lord because I, I, I remember who I served. I remember who I truly served, which was God. Oftentimes in our lives, we uh, let this leader become God to us. Mm. Because of our imperfection in ourselves, we're always teaching, searching for perfection in yeah. a leader. Well, they, they're, they're just like God. They should know better. Yeah, they should know better, but what if they don't know better? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we, we take God out of his place and we place our leader in, in that place, and that never works out for us. Here at Family Church, and this, I'm just going to, this is another brief thing. Um, we strive to be the best leaders we can possibly be. We're always improving. Yeah. We're always getting help. If we have some issues in our lives, we're going to therapy. It's not a bad word. We're going to therapy. We're getting help. We're talking to somebody. We're having some of our team members point things out that they may see in us that need some changing or some shaping. And oftentimes, people will come and tell you, hey, you're, this is, I think, an area of growth. Even today, I had to apologize for some things that I was doing wrong that, didn't, that, I didn't, that weren't the best that I could be. They weren't the best direction I could go, what I was responsible with. So I had to say I was, I apologize. And then sometimes we say I'm sorry. And, and, and I remember something, Pastor, you said something about apology and, and sorry. Yeah, you can, you can apologize without being sorry. Yeah. Right, because sorry has the connotation of sorrow. Like, I feel like I was wrong, so I need to say I'm sorry. But there are times that maybe you still think that you're in the right, yeah. but you need to apologize yeah. because you responded to that situation incorrectly or yeah. you said something incorrectly. So you can come across, and, and parents, I'm going to encourage you, like, apologize to your kids when you're wrong. Yeah. Apologize yeah. to your kids when you mm -hmm. act out in anger. Apologize to your spouse when the conversations go awry. It's very difficult, right? But it doesn't have to be sorrow. You don't have to be sorry to apologize, right? Apology restores the relationship. Yeah. yeah. Come on. That's good. And that, that's the key in any, anything that we're in is that we want to restore the relationship. Yeah. So with that, many times, you know, there's been a couple of times where the uh, pastor himself came to me and said, hey, and I didn't necessarily remember when, but he says, hey, I said something the way I, I shouldn't have said it. I apologize. And for me, that sets a precedent. That sets an example. So as I, as I step into further into leadership, I can see, hey, I need to apologize for mm -hmm. when I'm wrong, when I say something, when I know that I said something in a, in a way that might have hurt somebody. So what if you have experienced this from a leader? What should you do? What, what do I do with it? There's one, in Matthew 18, 15, it says, if your brother sins again, against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you have gained a brother. Sometimes people 
hurt you unintentionally. All right? I'm not talking about the people who are going around trying to purposely hurt people physically, spiritually, mentally, any of those sort of things. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a leader who makes a mistake and slips up. So what do I do? I go to the brother and say, hey, I think, you know, this was a little wrong. I, I, it hurt me when this happened. And then you have a conversation. So there's, there's ways to deal with the, the trauma that you might have experienced. Go to counseling. Talk to somebody that specializes in that, in that specific type of issue that you're yeah. going through. You know, church trauma, there's actually people who are actually certified and have gone to school to study this thing out to help you. Yeah, yeah speaking to someone's not gossip either. No. No. Right? So speaking to someone that can help the situation is healthy. Mm -hmm. Speaking to someone who cannot help the situation is gossip. Come on. Yeah. That is so mm -hmm. true. Yeah. That is so true. Because sometimes people just, wow, pastor so-and-so did this. And then telling these people when you could have went to pastor and said, hey, mm -hmm. pastor, I feel like this. Face to face. Remember we talked about forehead to forehead. Forehead to forehead, yeah. yeah. Where we have the confrontation where we can talk. Another way is confront. Go to the person. Don't go to your little friend. Go to the person. <laughs> Next is we allow God to construct in our lives, to build where our trauma put up walls. In our lives, we have walls where we allow trauma to build. Well, I'm never going to go there because that hurt, and I'm, I'm not doing that. But we have to allow the master builder, who is Jesus Christ, to come in and tear down the walls that we have allowed to build up to prevent us from having an open concept in our lives. It's to prevent us from having people come into our lives and, and us loving and sharing the love of Jesus because we have all these walls, because we have allowed trauma to keep us from doing that. Our trust is in Jesus, and we are always aspiring to be healthy leaders. And I'm going to talk to some leaders who are, might be even in the room or some spiritual leaders that might be watching us. In Jeremiah, it says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. You have a responsibility to your people to change. Yeah. You have a responsibility to your people to get healthy. Yeah. You have a responsibility to, these people are entrusted. You don't own them. You're a steward. So you're going to stand before the Lord and give account for the people that you may have hurt. And that's heavy. And so that, that, that's been my experience with how to deal with it from both ends. I've been on both sides. Yeah, yeah. to the pastor that may be watching as well. Healthy pastors lead healthy churches. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ooh, come on, sick see. pastors lead sick churches. Yeah. So you owe it to yourself to get away, get, get around other pastors that can build you up. The Bible says that iron sharpens iron. And in ministry, pastors can be very lonely because they don't make the right connections and the right friends. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a, Thank you, Pastor John Mark. That was awesome. So uh, the next thing that I saw through research why people typically go through a deconstruction um, process is because they feel as if the church is too quiet about certain topics. Or the other side of that is why is the church so loud about this one topic and all these other things are going on? Uh, Pastor Mike, would you talk to that for us today? Sure, yeah. First service, I rewrote my notes uh, on the fly, and so I'm still doing the same thing here. Uh, I'm going to give a story, an example of me trying to hit a hot topic and doing that and then the backlash that came from it. During the pandemic, the BLM movement was at front and center of society and media. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it became a very toxic moment in all of the realms of leadership. Because if you stayed quiet, then people are attacking you saying, you being quiet is part of the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and the reality was nobody knew what to say. Mm -hmm. No one knew what to do. And man, I was praying, Lord, is this an arena that I'm supposed to jump into? And, and I didn't feel like it was. And I was being attacked on both sides of society saying, Pastor Mike, you need to make a statement, you need to do something about this and, and say something. And I was like, I, honestly, like, I'm uneducated in this realm. I lead a very diverse life. My, my wife's Hispanic. I am Everything. a mutt. <laughs> <laughs> don't even know. I didn't do the, you know, 23 me thing or whatever it is. I don't even know what I am. Um, but like, I, so I was like praying, Lord, I need to know if this is something that I need to speak about or be involved in. And I got invited to pray for protection at a BLM rally, okay? And I was like, I went to the whole staff. I brought the whole staff in for a staff meeting. I said, hey, listen, I got this invitation. What, what do you want me to do? What do you think I should do? And I was praying about it. And let me just say this. I am associated with no political party. I am associated with no movement or agenda other than the movement of the kingdom of God. Come on. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. 
But I was asked to do something very specific, and it was pray for protection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who would I be to deny prayer? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I literally would not be a pastor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> literally, I would be an anti-Christian yeah. yeah. if I held back prayer from something that someone asked me to do. Mm -hmm. So we sat there as a team and we prayed because we knew what the implications were. We knew the implications were for me simply showing up to that event, mm -hmm. okay? So I went and I prayed. And a picture of me standing on a picnic table at a BLM rally got out and it literally split the church. Mm -hmm. Literally split the church. People left with no context. They knew no context of what I was doing. They saw a picture and they left. They judged and they left. And so that, that's a very difficult topic, right? Like, what do you do in that situation? I mean, I'm literally doing what the Word of God says, but people out of the context of what was happening judged and said, I can no longer be part of what you're doing, advancing the kingdom of God in praying. I mean, mm. come on. Like, we got some problems, y'all, yeah. all right? Yeah. And so many churches are quiet because they don't want the backlash yeah. of, of what comes in modern society of doing something, right? Yeah. Well, you picked a side. No, I did not. I picked God's side. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I literally did what Jesus did. I didn't say, Lord, condone what's happening or Lord, just stop what's happening. None of that. I literally prayed for peace and protection, yeah. Yeah. okay? Some pastors uh, won't jump into the ring because if they say something that's not culturally uh, accepted, they're going to be canceled, They'll be canceled. People are going to leave the church. Well, I'm going to go to a church that's Republican. I'm going to go to a church that's Democrat. Well, I mean, could you tell me what party Jesus was in? <laughs> All right. Come on, Pastor. Ooh. Because every time he was asked to take a side, are you Roman? Are you Jewish? He said, well, in my kingdom. Yeah. Mm. yeah. In my kingdom, right? Because he put it back to eternity, not temporal. Yeah. Come on. Mm -hmm. Say it. Come on. At the same time, if you're a church that's full of grace and truth, and open to reach the masses, then you're judged as being overly tolerant and sinfully accepting, even though you're teaching biblical truth. Yeah. So a lot of churches just say, let's just not touch that. Let's just preach the word of God. Let's preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, and let's not touch the hot topics. And, and what ends up happening is it creates a division even greater, this massive chasm between Christianity and the world. And what's funny is, and this is something I've deconstructed, is that Christians pride themselves on being better than the world. Mm -hmm. And we get it from John 15. Jesus is teaching his disciples. He brings them together. He says to them in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world will love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And so, what is the natural human response to someone hating you? Hate, hate them right back. back. Hate them right back. I hate the world. And so, it creates this even bigger divide, and Christians pride themselves. I'm not of the world. I'm better than the world. And therefore, instead of reaching the world and helping the world, we isolate and mm. insulate from the world. Come on. Yeah. It even gets deeper, right? <laughs> it even gets deeper because then Jesus begins to pray over his disciples. In John 17, two, two chapters later, Jesus is talking to his father on behalf of the disciples. He says, Father, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. I do not ask that you isolate Christians from the world, that you insulate them from the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. That although they're in this world, you protect them because there's evil around them. Look at this. He's praying for protection. <laughs> they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now he says this. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent them into the world, I have, I mean, as you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world, not out of the world. Not mm -hmm. out of hot topics, not out of culture, yeah. but I've put my word into culture. So I want to just talk real quickly about sanctification. It's this 
Christian word. It simply means set apart unto God. Okay, and so again, the church prides itself on, well, I've accepted Jesus Christ, I'm sanctified, I'm set apart. Although, let's just be for real, there's a lot of Christians you know who are just as nasty <laughs> as everybody else, so, just as angry, mm -hmm. give you the finger in five seconds for cutting you off on the road, but they got a Jesus sticker on their bumper. <laughs> now I'm sanctified, set apart. <laughs> The word sanctify is the word haja, um, I'm sorry, hajiazo, hajiazo, sanctified, set apart, hajiazo, and it says that we are hajiazo or set apart in the word, in the word of God. So the word of God is the only thing that separates us from the world, mm. and the word hajazio means that you're set apart for a specific mission. Mm. If you're not on a mission, you're not sanctified. So any of them old heads watching who, you know, you're a little religious and you think that you're sanctified, if you're not on mission, you're not sanctified. Wow. You're just separated. That's good. You're just isolated, yeah. right? And what's the mission? The mission is to be in the world and bring truth and life and grace and peace and joy into the world. That's the mission of God. Yeah. And so I think the reason why the church just doesn't hit the hot topics or like Pastor Chris said only hit hot topics and they pick one, like we're going to attack the LGBTQ plus community and they're just so outspoken about it, is either they've got some kind of hatred towards something or they feel that they are so separated from the world mm. that th they're somehow honoring God through their righteous anger. Yeah. Mm. We never see Jesus do that. Yeah. You never... I mean, you saw Jesus' righteous anger when, they, when he flipped over tables in the temple because they were exchanging money. And the, oh, listen, and the only reason why he flipped over the table out of anger was because they were exchanging money at the wrong rate. <laughs> that they were robbing God's people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got to do your homework on that. Okay. <laughs> and the only other time that he shows a little bit was when the disciples stopped kids from coming to him. He says, suffer not. Mm -hmm. The little children that come unto me. Other than that, you never saw God get out of, or Jesus get out of pocket yeah. over a cultural group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even a subculture. Never. He went to Samaria where he didn't belong. He went places. He was attacked for eating dinner with the, the politicians and the lawyers. And they said, him, what are you doing? How can you be with those people? Well, it's because Jesus was on a table praying in a park <laughs> for people's protection and safety. And he was always taken out of context. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's good. Thank you for that. Real good. Mm -hmm. Another topic in which people tend to find themselves deconstructing their faith uh, is Christian hypocrisy. Uh, Liana, would you talk about the hypocrisy? And none better to teach us about hypocrisy than <laughs> Liana. <laughs> so I grew up in church, so I am a natural church hypocrite. <laughs> we're just going to call it like it is today. And if we're being completely honest, anybody who grew up in church has a tendency to be hypocritical. Mm -hmm. um, back when I was in college, I was checking out a church for the very first time. So I was scoping out everything, like, is this the place for me, blah, 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 right? We get to worship, and I see the drummer, and I'm like, he was at a party last night, but I only knew because I was at the same party. <laughs> but I was okay in my mind because I wasn't serving mm -hmm. at this church. Because when I went home on the weekends, you would catch me on the worship team too. <laughs> so I was being super hypocritical, and that's just one of the so, examples. So did you think in yourself, like, how could he... Be on the drums right now when he was just at a party last night. Yeah. My Although first, you were at the same party. I was at the same party. Yeah. And my first thought was like, who does he think that he is that he can go do this? <laughs> Mind you, I'm in the same building. <laughs> <laughs> we see this all the time in church. And it doesn't make it right. And it's become normal, which is what causes people to move away from the, the faith. My instinct was to judge him and call him out because that's what I had seen all my life versus trying to see what was going on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. In Matthew 7, 3 verse, and 5, we read, Jesus is talking to the religious leaders, and he's saying, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? 
How can you say to another, to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. We tend to judge others without inspecting ourselves first. And if you're looking at this verse, you can't see clearly with a uh, plank in your eye. Anybody wear contacts? When you blink, sometimes they move. Isn't it the most frustrating thing because you're just trying to see? So if that's the case with this verse, and it is, you're getting frustrated, you're getting annoyed. So that emotion that I feel towards myself with that own frustration of what I'm going dealing with is now what I'm projecting to others because it's easier for me to distract and deflect to somebody else mm -hmm. than to deal with what I'm going through myself. That's good. Jesus, when he's addressing the religious leaders, he's telling them that the purpose of addressing somebody else is to help them. It's to help fix something. It's not just to call them out. It's not to bring them down or bash them. So in Reconstruction, where do you find yourself today? Do you see yourself like the religious leaders, just calling out people and deflecting what you're going through? Or are we really working towards being like Jesus and trying to address and help others while they're moving along through life? That's really good. good. Thank you for that, Liana. <laughs> and then our last topic we will address today is personal grief. Uh, why is all this bad stuff happening to good people? Why me? Why do I have to go through this? Uh, Ms. Cindy, could you speak to that today? Sure. Um, first, let me directly answer that question. Um, when God created the world, <laughs> You know, he put the animals on it. He put the people on it. Created. Created them. <laughs> he created it all. So it's kind of. He formed me <laughs> with intention. Come on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't just. I mean, just look. Anyways. <laughs> the care that he took. Anyways. Just put people in. He created us all. <laughs> and he pretty much, he just set the world in motion and told us to live. The word says that he tells us, you have the choice between life and death, and we choose. So God's not up here like a puppet master and we're all on strings where he's making things happen. Things happen because we're human. That's a whole deconstruction topic right there. It, yeah. is. it is. And things happen because we're human. We make decisions. Sometimes it's not our decision. Sometimes we're doing great. We're doing exactly what we need to do. And somebody else's action causes something bad to happen to us. Um, and that leads us to grieving, whether it's grieving the loss of a person or grieving the loss of a life that we thought we were going to have, we still have to deal with grief. And this topic's kind of hard because I know for me, I can't personally say that I was taught the right way or the wrong way to grieve. I don't think anybody really is. Um, what happens is you grow up and you see how people react to things in life or you hear the things they say and there's almost like these unspoken rules that you follow and you never think to question. It's just the way things are, so this is how you react. For instance, when I was a kid, my go-to um, expression of emotion was tears. I cried a lot as a kid. And people would make comments. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> I saw you crying during the video. <laughs> Anyways, people would make comments, and it would be like, stop crying. How old are you? Why do you have to be so sensitive? Emotional. Never in the history of ever has that actually helped anybody who's in the <laughs> middle of some sort of emotional issue. But you grow up, and loss occurs, and you shut down. As you get older, you start shutting down because crying is not acceptable. Similarly, when you're raised in church, especially back in the day, if life wasn't going well, um, you were struggling, it was kind of beating you up, it was because you didn't have enough faith. You weren't believing God enough for things to be better. Or sometimes it was, what are you doing wrong? Yeah, what sin do you have in your life <laughs> yeah. that's allowing the devil to do this to you? Yeah. But here's the thing. You would ask for advice, and the advice was almost always, well, read your Bible and pray more. So it's like, thanks, that didn't help. <laughs> it's, I was already doing that, and I still feel like this, you know. And, but what happens is grief doesn't follow rules. 
So we're following all these rules, but grief doesn't follow rules. Grief isn't like, well, she's been reading her word, and she's been praying for an hour, so I'm going to go mess with somebody else today. Yeah. Because grief doesn't make sense. It could be a year down the road, and you think everything's going great, and something real innocent will just come and knock your feet out from under you. And then when that happens, old teaching would say, well, I guess you're not following 1 Peter 5, 7. Because 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast your cares on him because he cares about you. And if you had casted your cares, he'd be caring about you right now. <laughs> you didn't cast far enough. You caught it again. Uh, apparently. <laughs> but that's lies. The scripture itself is truth. But the thought that you can't feel in your grief is a lie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus heard that his best friend died, and he stood there and wept. Mind you, the Christ himself knew that he was about to raise his friend up from the dead, and he still took the time to grieve. Yeah. Yeah, he allowed himself the time to grieve. Yeah. He took that moment. We can feel what we feel. The problem is when we get stuck yes. in what mm -hmm. we feel. Yes. So what do we do? First, we do follow 1 Peter 5, 7. But what we need to understand is that it's not a one-shot deal. We don't just, like, cast our cares and everything's supposed to be better. We continue to cast those cares. And sometimes that does mean praying. You continue talking to God and asking him for his help. Find something that keeps your mind from falling into despair. Isaiah 26, 3 says, he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. That means that God will keep you in peace as long as you keep your mind on him. That doesn't mean that he's the only thing you think of. But when you're having a moment, when you're feeling overwhelmed, you stop and you try to center yourself and you think on the promises of God, the good things of God. Sometimes you have a song, something that you listen to that helps calm you. I know I have one on my phone that that's my song I go to. You turn it on and you just let the words comfort you. And it, there's been a time or two where he's come in and he's heard the song and he's like, are you okay? Just What's turn going around, on? Walk right back out. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, it helps. And then other times, you just have to let the words out. You have to speak to somebody. And you just, some, you know, it could be a friend that you speak to. It could be a counselor. Um, I think it's very important for have somebody that you really speak to. But sometimes it's just between you and God. And you're just like, Lord, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I thank you that you're always here for, him, for me. Your word says that you will not leave me or forsake me. Yeah. And, Lord, I'm sad, I'm angry, and I need your help. And that's it. You don't have to have a theological degree. You don't have to be anybody special. Just talk to him. Yeah, because your grief is going to be triggered. Yeah. Grief is going to be triggered by smells, tastes, experiences. Mm -hmm. I know when, when uh, Cindy's mom died, uh, me and her had a very, very close relationship. And every time I would barbecue on the barbecue grill, I'd think of mom. Yeah. I'd be like, oh, my God, she would love this chicken that I just made. And then she'd walk up and be like, man, that's banging. And that's exactly <laughs> she did like a certain way. That's banging. <laughs> and like, man, I like desire to hear that. And the first year when I would be triggered by that grief, it was despair. It was a full-on anxiety attack. My chest would get tight. I'd have to go get some air. Uh, between diagnosis and death, we had 17 days with, with mom. Mm -hmm. 17 days. So for us, it was a gut punch, out of nowhere, yeah. despair. And even today, years later, um, I still think of her every time I grew. Mm -hmm. But the despair is gone. Right, that, that gut-wrenching pain is gone, but the scar is still there. I still think about her. And, and that's in those moments that she's talking about here. It's like the church wants to say, just pray in tongues, pray in the Holy Ghost, build yourself up, and you're going to get over it. But I, I'm never going to get over the, the space that she held in my life. Yeah. And, and we need to give people the grace yeah. and the space yeah. To process that and work through it and, and not think that they have to operate on someone else's timeline no. of what grief looks like. Yeah. Come on, Pastor. Amen? Come on. Yeah. That's really good. Thank you for that. The purpose, the purpose of our conversation today was to highlight different 
uh, avenues in which people might find themselves deconstructing their faith, we understand that we could not have covered every topic. Yeah. Um, but the biggest point that we want you to take with you today is that we don't want you to deconstruct your faith and remain stuck. Like, that's not a place to stay. We have the Holy Spirit, we have the Bible as our guide so that we can reconstruct our faith. Um, I have a couple of points that I want you to write down and take a picture of or put it in your phone so that you have some tools when you find yourself deconstructing your faith, all right? The first point is this, ask the Holy Spirit to be your guide. We read in John 14, 26, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and remain and remind you of everything I have told you. Don't demolish your faith without the Holy Spirit being present. Invite the builder into the process. It's good. Second point I would like for you to write down is use the Bible as your blueprint. We read in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp for my feet wow. and a light on my path. Something that we can take with us is that we don't have to wander aimlessly through this process of deconstruction. Why? Because we have the blueprint. Yeah. We have the correct path to take, and we don't have to do it alone. We can ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us to all truth. In your word. That's good. All right? The third point I would like for you to write down is this. Surround yourself with other believers. Acts 2, 42 reads this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And, and before we uh, talk about this, I also want you to, they don't have this on notes, but uh, Proverbs 18, 24 reads, One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. We don't have to do this alone. Life happens, and sometimes we question our faith, but we have tools and we have resources. Today, if you find yourself in this process of deconstructing your faith and needing to reconstruct your faith, I would like to pray for you, but also connect with some of our leaders here today. We want to make sure you have the tools to be successful. If you have friends and family members that are going through this process and they have questions, don't push them away and don't think they're crazy. Work through the process of figuring out these questions with them. Uh, let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we thank you for who you are and we thank you for walking with us in every season. We ask that you would guide us to all truth in every season. We thank you that you are constantly with us and leading and directing us. Father, awaken us to your truth in every situation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. We thank you so amen. much for joining us today. Y'all have a wonderful week. Love you. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that. And you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.